Good morning to everyone, and welcome to The Well here at STSA as we are starting a brand new series today called, as you see up on the screen, Healing Hurts. And this coincides with the beginning of the Holy 40 Days of Lent. Okay, Lent started a week ago, but you know that the first week is like a preparation week, and then the Holy 40 Days, we say like Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights, begins this weekend and runs through uh, Palm Sunday. And during that time, we're going to discuss one topic, which is this topic of healing. But before I get into the topic, let me do a survey, and I want show of hands, and this applies to the people who are watching at home as well. Show of hands, wherever it is that you're watching. How many people believe, how many people believe that God can heal people today? Raise your hands. How many people? Okay, so how many people, so that's pretty much everyone, and I hope on the, at home everyone's hand is up. How many people, let's, let's keep on going, how many people got, believe that God can heal physically today, whether it's diseases or cancer or coma, okay, everyone's hand is up. How many people believe that God can heal emotional sicknesses today, whether it's unforgiveness or hurts or past, very good, very, fantastic. How many people believe that God can heal relational sickness and relational problems today, broken homes, broken marriages? Okay, very good, everyone's hand is up. Now I want to ask you the same questions, but I just want to add one word to all of those questions, and I won't ask you for a show of hands because I believe the answer might change. I'm just going to add one word to all of those questions. The same word, it's two little letters, and see if it makes a difference. How many people believe, don't raise your hands, how many people believe that God can heal my sickness today? How many people believe that God can heal my emotional baggage, my hurts, my bitterness, my resentment? How many people believe that God can heal my home and my relational dysfunction? Somehow, again, I didn't ask for a show of hands, my bet is a lot of hands that were up at the beginning may have gone down. And maybe some, that, maybe some just got a little shaky, okay? They were just kind of in between doing one of these things. And that's exactly why we're doing this series. We're doing this series called Healing Hurts because Lent, more than anything else, Lent is a journey towards healing, okay? Lent is a journey towards healing, or as Father Abraham talked about last week, it's a road trip. Now, I want to, I want to, I want to this, this definition right here, there's two words I want to focus on, journey and healing. Let's start with journey. First, Lent is a journey Lent is not a season. Oftentimes we think of Lent as a season, but season means nothing. Okay, season just means something that the calendar says. So like today it's winter, like yesterday it was winter and it was 70 degrees, next week is spring and it could be snowing. So it just, season means nothing. Season just means the calendar says it's March 21st, so therefore it's spring or it's March 20th. And somehow that's how we, sometimes it's how we approach Lent. It's Lent because the calendar says it's Lent. And Lent just means something you just kind of go through. And I always talk about the merry-go-round, okay? The merry-go-round the, of, of the church calendar, which is like, okay, now it's Christmas, and now we do Christmas stuff, and now it's Lent, and then it's the summertime, and now it's this, then hey, rinse and repeat. Okay, now it's Christmas again. And we just kind of going through it. No, Lent is not a season. Lent is a journey. What's the difference between a season and a journey? A journey means you start in a place, and you end in a different place. It's not much of a journey if I start here and I end up here, unless it's like a round trip. But in general, a journey means that I start someplace and I'm moving towards a destination or a goal. And I'm not just passing the time as I would during a season, but I'm going somewhere. And if I start a journey and I end up in the same spot, something is wrong. And please, if we start Lent, and we fast for 55 days, and we end up in the same spot as we started. Like, come on. Like, that's a waste of time. It's a waste of effort. A waste of effort. That's a waste of, of precious time that could be spent with meat. Okay, that's what it is more than anything else. So Lent for us is not a season. Lent is a journey. It's a, it's, 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 we're trying to get somewhere. And where it is that we're trying to get, the word that I'm going to use here is healing. The reason I chose the word healing, like sometimes we would think it's like Lent is all about salvation because it's all about Christ on the cross and it's about uh, resurrection. And it's about salvation. And I'm not against that. It is 100% about salvation. But I remember several years ago, I've shared this story in the past. Some people may have heard it before, is that I was at a conference and I was speaking. It was like a college and graduate conference 
from the Indian Orthodox Church. This was probably like 10, 15 years ago, something like that. And they asked me to come and speak at the conference. And when I got there, I discovered that there was another guest speaker. It was like me and this other guy. And he is like a very distinguished theologian, like PhDs, not PhD, PhDs, okay? Like written many books, sits on the, the board of like seminaries and, and, and academic institutions. And it's like me and him. And I got there and I'm like, am I in the right place? Like, did, did, did you pick up somebody else? But they said, no, you're in the right place and you're, you, he's going to talk and you're going to talk. And then I heard him speak. And after I heard him speak, what I discovered is, okay, that, that changed my, my mentality of what a true theologian is. Because that guy, I understood every word he said, and all the kids who were there understood every word he said. And it shows that the true theologian is not the person who confuses people, but the person who clarifies. Just like the good doctor isn't the one who gets good test grade. The good doctor is the one who can explain to a child why his boo-boo hurts. And that's what I discovered about a true man of God is the one who can, okay, doesn't just use big words for no reason. But anyway, he taught me something. And he told me the word salvation has been abused has been misused and misunderstood. And everyone means, says salvation means different things. He said, anytime you want to understand clearly what does salvation mean, replace it with the word healing. And instead of saying Christ came to save us, I'm not saying Christ didn't come to save us. Christ came to save us. But if you want to define or you want to distill it or you want to clarify it, what does it mean that Christ came to save us? Use the word heal. Because Christ didn't come just for the salvation of all mankind the way we think of it. Christ came for the healing of all mankind. What does that mean? That was like an aha moment for me. We think of salvation in terms of a ticket to go to heaven after we die. That's how we think of it. Okay, because we are bottom line. Like, we don't got time. Just give me the, high, give me the bullet points. Salvation means I'm going to heaven or I'm going to hell. That's all it boils down to. But no, 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 no. Salvation is so much more than that. Salvation is not just a ticket to go to heaven after you die. That's part of it. But salvation is just, about, uh, just as much about this life. Like saying God sent his son to save us, meaning that we go to heaven after we die, nothing else, is like saying, I want to adopt that orphan so that she can have a good retirement plan when she gets to 65 years old. No, like, yeah, you want her to have a good retirement, like for sure. And you want her to be comfortable, but there's so much more leading up to there. Like you want her to live a good life when she's like four years old and five years old and six. That's why you, that's why you adopt a child. Well, it's the same thing. Our God, fill in the blank for me since we're doing trivia. Our God is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living. Our God and salvation doesn't just apply after we die. Like it doesn't make a difference today and tomorrow and the next day. But when you die, that's called insurance. Okay, God is more than just an insurance plan that in case of disaster or in case of death, like God is not just a life insurance. God is salvation for all mankind, healing for all mankind, and that applies today. 1 John chapter 5, verse 12. St. John says, He who has the Son has life, but he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Now my question for you is, what's this life? Is he talking just about eternal life, like something that happens after we die? Or does it mean something right here? Like St. John is talking about people right now who are breathing, who are living, but don't have life. Because you know what this life is? It's a healed life. It's a whole life. Whole, W-H-O-L-E, whole. <clears throat> because salvation is more than just after we die. Salvation is about living healed while we are alive. And this is why, if you look at the prayers of the church, there's one particular prayer that you may not realize it, but it is said at just about every single church service. Every church service, whether it's in the church or outside the church, whether it's funeral or whether it is um, a, a, a liturgy, whether it's a blessing of a home, every church service, for the most part, not every, but most church services have a prayer for the sick. And in, I, I used to think about it, like we would go to bless someone's house. Someone gets a new house, and the first prayer we pray is the prayer of the sick. And you're like, well, what's the connection between the house and the sick? Well, the connection is the church is a hospital. And the goal of everything the church does, again, is not just life insurance after we die, but healing as we are here on this earth. I want to show you an excerpt from the prayer of the sick, and I want you to see the connection between salvation and healing. Salvation and healing. This is what we pray. Say, all souls that are distressed or bound, give them mercy, give them rest, give them coolness, 
Give them grace. Give them help. Give them salvation. Give them the forgiveness of their sins and their iniquities. Look, it's praying that right now, give them something now. Give them help. Give them grace. Give them salvation, meaning give them healing. If the purpose was just go to heaven after we die, then how come I don't go in the prayer of the sick and say, Lord, take them to heaven now. Okay, somebody is sick, and why don't I just come and say, like, if that's the goal of salvation, just, Lord, take them up to heaven right now. Two reasons. Number one, if I pray that, the family may send me to heaven right now. Okay, that might be the first consequence of what happens. And the second thing is, the goal of the prayer isn't just the person dies and goes to heaven. The purpose is that they find healing on this earth and then go to heaven at when God says the right time is. Keep on going. As for us, O Lord, this is what the priest prays. The maladies of our souls heal, and those of our bodies too do cure. That's not after death. It's talking about right now. O you, the true physician of our souls and our bodies, the bishop of all flesh, visit us with your salvation. Healing and salvation are intertwined because you can look at them, you can say the same word in both places. What we need is healing relationally. That's what we're praying right here, is give healing to our broken relationships. Give restoration to our broken homes. What we are praying is, Lord, give healing and salvation to our sick spirits that are enslaved to sin and lust and addiction and all kinds of bad stuff. We are praying, Lord, give healing to my mind and my heart, which is controlled by anxiety and by grief and by worry. We're asking God to make us whole. That's what salvation is all about. And that's why Jesus came. He said it this way in Mark 2, 17. He says, those who are how well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The goal of everything we do in the church, why we read our Bible, why we pray, why we fast, why we give, why we serve, why we do everything we do is to get to the healed life is to find that salvation. Yes, after we die, but also while we are alive and living on this earth. Again, as we pray in the liturgy, finish the sentence for me. Make us worthy to partake of your holy mysteries unto the purification of our souls, bodies, and spirits. Like that's what we're praying for. That's why we partake of, the, of communion for the purification, the sanctification, the healing of our entire person. And that's what Lent is all about. So here's what we're going to do during this series. During this series, we are going to go week by week with the good physician, the great physician of our souls, our bodies, and our spirits. And we are going to follow him week by week. And what we're going to see is that every week, we're going to see Jesus interacting, for the most part, next week is a slight exception, but for the most part, we will see Jesus interacting with broken and sick people who are in need of healing. And sometimes they'll be physical, like the blind man. Sometimes they will be emotional. Sometimes they'll be relational, okay, like the prodigal son or the Samaritan woman. We're going to see Jesus coming to people who are in bad shape, who are living an unhealed life. And we're going to see how he brings healing to them. And for our purposes, we're going to learn the path. We're going to follow the same steps that they followed, that he instructed them to see how we can find this healing in our life. And let me give you the punchline kind of from the start of, of the series of what we're going to discover. What we're going to discover is that being healed isn't the same as being not sick. Being healed isn't the same as being not sick. Just like being fixed isn't the same as being not broken. One we want, one he wants. We want not sick. We want never sick. We want no problems. We want no issues. And what we want is, okay, God, just remove the bad stuff from my life. And actually, you know what? While you're at it, make all the consequences go away. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. But that's not how it works. Like when you go to the hospital, they don't remove your sickness. Like you don't come in with a broken leg and they say, oh, boop, that never happened anymore. Boop, boop, boop. That's fun. That's not what happens. They fix it. They heal it. Okay, when I went into the doctor and I had a, a, a disc, a herniated disc in my back, he didn't say, boop, now that's gone, that's never again. He said, no, I'm going to help you to heal it. But healing takes time. Healing takes effort. Like, which would you want? Back to my back example. Which do you want? Me to just numb the pain so you don't feel it? Or you want me to give you the therapy and the exercises to fix it? 
We want not sick. God gives us healed. And if you're wondering how that works, let me ask you a different question. I'm going to ask you a question like I asked you in the beginning, and I'm going to give you the same word a second time. How many people, you don't need to raise your hands because I already know the answer. How many people believe that God is everywhere? How many people believe that God is in every circumstance? How many people believe that God is with every person? How many people believe that there's not an inch on this planet, on this universe, in anything that's created, seen and unseen? There's not one square inch that God isn't fully present. And the answer is everyone believes that. So let me add the same, let me add the same word now. Not how many people believe that God is present in all circumstances. How many people believe that God is present in my circumstances? How many people not just believe that God is present in every home, but is present in my home, in my problem, in my circumstance, in my unsolvable? We all know that God is with us everywhere. And we know that God has promised to never leave us alone. And I'm telling you, that includes our problems. And that includes our sicknesses and the things that, that we suffer from. And the key to finding healing is going to be to find him in there. Let's go some examples from the scriptures. Once upon a time, you know this story about there was three youth, three young men who were thrown into a furnace to burn to death because they refused to bow to an idol. Okay, and they were thrown into a furnace and they prayed, God, here's how we would pray. God, remove the fire. Remove the furnace. And what does God do? Does God remove the furnace? No, God stands in there with them. See how he solves? See how he didn't make them not sick? But see how he healed them? He didn't make the problem to go away, but he stood with them in it. And that was the beginning of their solution. Same, they had a buddy named Daniel. Daniel found himself in a tough predicament one day, face to face with a lion. Found himself in a locked place with a lion. I don't want to be with a lion in an open space or a locked space or any kind of space. The only kind of lion I want to see is the stuffed kind. That's the only kind of lion. But there's David or Daniel face to face with a lion. God remove the lion? Nope. Well, what's God going to do? How about I come sit next to you in the lion's den? So how about instead of being not ever broken, not ever in a problem, not ever sick, how about I come and give you healing by standing next to you? David and Goliath, you know the story. David, big guy Goliath, Lord, I'm in trouble. Make Goliath short. Make Goliath small. Make Goliath break his left hand and his right hand and maybe his kneecaps. No, 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 no. God doesn't remove problems. What God does is stand next to us in the problems. And then the best of the best. <clears throat> There's one guy who had serious problems in life. One guy who was, to quote an expression which I hear a lot these days, a hot mess of a life. I'm going to go with Job. And in case you don't know the story of Job, Job in like one day, Job lost his family. Job lost his livestock, which means like all his money, his future, his retirement, his everything else. He lost his health. And on top of that, his wife was nagging him. So like the worst of the worst days imaginable possible, like Job was a mess and everything in Job, like Job needed physical healing. Job needed relational healing. Job needed emotional healing. Job needed everything. And what did God do for Job? Did he solve all his problems? Did he remove all his problems? Did God go and, and erase everything that had taken place in Job's life? End of Job. Job chapter 42 verse 5 tells us. God didn't do any of that. Job says, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. You see, what God did for Job, he didn't erase any of his problems. He didn't erase anything. At, like God didn't go like back to the future. Like let's go back in time and make it so that, that. No, that's not what God did. Well, God said, Job, I'm going to stand with you in the problems. And before, Job, you've heard of me. Like there you are, Job, in your problems. And you heard of me, this God, okay, this creator. And that's like us in a lot of ways, right? Like we've heard of God healing people. We've heard of God answering prayers. We've heard of God touching hearts. We've heard of God like freeing people who are enslaved. Like we've heard of this. But we had to do like Job right here. Who says, I have heard of you with my ear. But now my eye sees you. And that gets us to kind of the, the, the key to finding healing. The key to finding healing is this. Healing comes from finding the healer in our circumstances. Healing comes from finding the healer in our circumstances. And this is 
I don't think I'm a very smart person. I don't think I'm a very wise person. But if there's like one smart thing that I've said in my life or that I'll say to anyone, like if you ever want to listen to one piece of thing from me, listen to this. This is like the one million dollar advice for me. When you are in a trial or a tribulation or in a situation or whatever it may be, stop looking for answers. Start looking for the one who wrote the test. Stop trying to find answers to the questions. Start looking for the one who wrote the test. Stop trying to find solutions. Find the solver. Stop trying to find a way out and find the one who put you in. Because I promise you, because you said it, your theology says it, that God is everywhere. There isn't an inch on this planet that God doesn't exist. There isn't one molecule that isn't fully under his control. And that includes your problems. That includes your sicknesses. That includes your unsolvable situations that you've been praying for and that you've been waiting for an answer and that you wish had never happened and God just take this out of my life. All of those things. God is present. And the, the start to the healing journey is finding him in them. And like I said, that's what we're going to do in this series. We're going to go week by week. We're going to walk foot step by footstep with Christ as he meets broken people as he meets confused people, as he meets blind people, blind physically, blind inside, as he meets people who are broken and despair and hopeless, and we're going to walk with him step by step, and we're going to see how in every one of those situations, he revealed himself, and he showed himself to that person. And as soon as he revealed himself to that person, the healing process began. And I'm telling you, if there's ever a time, you agree with me on this one, okay? If there's ever a time that we need the healing presence of God is this year. Like Lent is always a special time. We know that Lent is always a sacred time and a special time. But this year, like, come on, like after all that we've been through in the past year, and I'm not talking about like, I'm not talking about me. Like I'm talking about us, we as a church family and us as a community and us as a nation, us as the world, like after all we've been through, like there's people in our church, like we've in our church family, we've seen sickness, we've seen death, we've seen serious mental health issues surface. We've seen broken homes. Like we've seen a lot in his past 12 months. And I'm telling you, God, after all that, there's no way God doesn't have a special healing during this time of Lent. Like Lent already is special. Lent already is healing. And I'm telling you this year, I believe it with all my heart. God wants to do a great, great work, a mighty work. And that's why he has been preparing us throughout this whole time. And the starting point is like Job is like the three youth, is like Daniel. The starting point is to find him. Because when we see him, we see everything that we need for healing. Our key verse is going to be this. It's going to be our, 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 our theme verse for this series, Jeremiah 30, 29, 13. And you will seek me and find me when you search me with all your heart. Say that with me. Or say it with me together. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Let's go one more time because I would love to memorize this verse by the end of this series. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. That's going to be us throughout this next six weeks. We are going to seek. We are going to search. We're going to do with all our hearts. And we trust because this is a, a money back guarantee. This is, this, is, this is God himself saying that if you seek and if you search and if you open your eyes, whether you're the Samaritan woman, whether you're the prodigal son, whether you're the born blind, whether you're in a, in a broken home, whether you got the emotional baggage, whether it's the physical, whether it's the spiritual, anyone who's any state of sickness, you search for me, you seek for me with all your heart, and you will find me money back guarantee. That's God himself speaking. That's what we're going to do in this series. Sound like a good plan? Okay, good. Before we find him, though, we need to start with a homework assignment. Today is the first. We're setting kind of the, the, the beginning as we kick off this journey. And there's a homework assignment from the start. Okay, because we're not here just to mess around. We're going to start with homework. And it's a homework assignment that everyone needs to do, and you need to do it this week. And that is going to be this. Starting point of this journey is set a goal. Set a goal. Because it's a journey, not a season. Because it's a journey... The starting point of any journey is, where am I going? Where's the destination? Like you get in the car, you don't just start driving. You put in a GPS where it is you're trying to get to. But you don't just say to yourself, I'm going to just drive and where are you trying to get? It's a journey. Starts today, 
ends in six weeks. Where do you want to be? If you start right here, where do you want to be in six weeks? Whether, like I said, it's relational healing, whether it is uh, emotional healing, whether it is spiritual healing, like I don't know where it is that you want to be. And let me tell you what a not good answer is. I'll tell you what a not good answer is, what a lazy answer is. I want to get close to God. <laughs> okay, I want to get close to God. That's not a good answer. Okay, because that's kind of like the whole purpose of life. And that's just basically a cop out. Saying I want to get close to God is like saying we're going to go on vacation, sweetheart. Okay, where are we going to go? We're going to go west. Okay, like west. Like what's west? Like west like Hawaii west? Or west like West Virginia west? There's a very big difference between the two. So same thing spiritually. Okay, what's the, where am I headed this Lent? Get close to God. No, 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 no. Be specific. Where is your brokenness? Where is it that you need God the most? What aspect of your life, what relationship is the most void of God that God, we need God's healing touch there? What thought pattern? Okay, what habit? What it become, and maybe it's an addiction. What, what, what is it that is in your life where you feel like I need God the most? Where God's touch is lacking in my life? Be specific. You've heard the expression, he who aims for nothing, he who aims for nothing, hits it every time. Never heard that before? Okay. Never heard it? It's, okay, I invented it then. That's for me. Okay, that's, yes. Copyright me, okay? He who aims for nothing hits it every time. That's like the guy, okay, with the, the, the archery guy, okay? And there's no aim, and then boop, uh, uh, wherever it hits is where I say I was aiming for. He who aims for nothing hits it every time. Copyright Father Anthony, 2021. It would be a shame. Agree with me. It would be a shame. It would be a shame to fast for two months. Two months. It would be a shame to fast for two months and end up in the exact same place that we started, wouldn't it? So what is your goal? In today's gospel, the first Sunday of Lent, Jesus emphasizes the importance of setting a goal. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21, Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus speaks about treasures, and we can substitute the word treasures with goal, destination, our aim. What is it that we're, what is it we're driving towards? Your treasure is what is it that you, inst- you input into the GPS as, this is where I want to get to. And you realize that once you put it in the GPS, Okay, once, once you set, like, that's the goal, that's the treasure, then what the GPS does, if I start to stray over here, it says, come back over here. And if I go too much, it, starts, it always is pulling me back. It's like a magnet. Your treasure becomes your magnet. So if my treasure is, make as much money as possible, be as rich as possible, then you know what? Every time I'm over here and they're like, uh, come over for dinner, or let's go out to dinner, I'm like, well, I'm going to spend a lot of money, so no, no, thank you over there. It pulls me back over here. And then this person said, investment over here. So it, the, 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 the treasure is always pulling me back. If relationship is your treasure, whatever it is, it's your treasure. So what Jesus is telling us right here is set for yourself a good goal. And set for yourself a goal that, that, that makes sense and that lasts, where thieves can't break in and steal and where moth and rust don't destroy. Because whatever goal you set is going to always pull you. It's going to be the lens through which you filter all of your decisions in life. And like I said, there's some goals that last and some that don't last. So it's not enough just to set a goal. We've got to set a good goal. Some goals can be stolen, can be destroyed, and some will last forever. So for example, would a good goal for this Lent be a new job? Can that be stolen away from me? Yes. That is not a good goal because that can be stolen. You can lose that job. Someone else can, the job is here today and gone tomorrow. Okay, we we, we change jobs right now. Like we changed toothbrushes when we were kids. Okay, so... That's not a good goal. But how about a goal of a new outlook on money and a new outlook on a career? Well, that's a much better goal because that's something that no one can take from me. How about the goal of 
I want my spouse to leave me alone. <laughs> I want my spouse to stop nagging me about this. Is that a good goal? No, it's not a good goal. Because what isn't nagged about today may be nagged about tomorrow. Okay, so it, 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 it doesn't get you anywhere. But how about a goal of true communication and honesty in my marriage? That's a good goal. How about a new level of intimacy in my marriage? Like, that's a good goal. That's something that no one can take from me. Spiritually, would a good goal be, I want to avoid this sin for 55 days. I want to avoid this sin. It sounds like it's a good goal. But you know what? You can avoid a sin kind of like holding your breath. Like, you can hold your breath for, not 55 days, obviously, but, but I'm saying when it comes to sin, you can, like, hold your breath, okay, and you can, but then in the end, on day 56, you're worse than you started. So I don't think that's a good goal. But a good goal might be to get to the root of why I keep falling back into it. To understand why is it that no matter how many times I promise, no matter how many times I wanted to change, I keep coming back into it. So you know what? Even if I fall, that's not the, the target here. The target is I get to the root of it and I find help. And that's why Jesus said this at the end of this passage, verse 33. He said, seek first, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. That's the goal of this series. That's the goal of Lent, to seek first the kingdom of God and to trust him with the rest. To seek first the internal, the healing on the inside, to get to the root and trust him with the rest. We want, get rid of my problems. We want, get rid of on the outside. But you know what? That's not what we need. We've tried that before. That's why in this series, we are not going to focus on outside stuff. We are not going to focus on the things on the exterior. We're going to focus on the inside. And there's two analogies Okay, I'm going to give you two analogies that's going to kind of carry us through these next several weeks in this series. Two analogies that we'll, we'll use throughout. The first analogy is building a house or a building or whatever it was. Any builders right here? Anyone in construction, construction engineering, anything like that? Anyone play with Legos here? Legos, Legos? Okay, very good. Okay, let's go with the Legos. <laughs> Me, I love watch construction. Like I remember before I was a priest, the guy was a consultant, and I was at a project downtown in D.C., and I used to, every day on my lunch break, just take a walk outside, because they were doing this big, huge construction project. I think it was like the, uh, what's it called? Some kind of conference center or some kind of big, huge thing, okay, right by Verizon Center or whatever it was over there, and every day I would go out there, and I loved to watch it. And I remember, when I was watching it, the one thing I remember is the foundation takes forever, forever. And it seems like no progress is being made. Just forever in the foundation. And you're like, come on. Like y'all sitting there working. Like there's a hundred of you guys. You're working all day and all night. And there's nothing to show for it. Just the, actually the hole keeps getting deeper and deeper. Like it's not, it's going backwards, not forwards. But once that foundation, what I remember seeing, once the foundation is up, the rest of it pops up no time. So that taught me a lesson. And the lesson is a consumer versus a builder looks at buildings, looks at homes in a different, completely different way. A consumer or a novice or someone who is untrained goes and looks at a new house and, and, and looks at the outside and says, oh, you know what? I like the color of the wall. Well, this carpet is looking very, very nice. Oh, look at the shower. It's the, with the two nozzles, okay? So you can shower your belly and your face at the same time, okay? So it's like, oh, wow, this is great. That's a novice. A builder doesn't look at those things. What does a builder look at? The stuff that can't be seen. He doesn't look at the carpet. He looks at the structure underneath the carpet. He doesn't look at the color of the walls. He looks at, the, at what's inside the walls. He doesn't look at the double nozzle or the, the belly shower, whatever it is. He looks at the piping behind all those things because he realizes, because he's a wise builder, that if the foundation is good and the foundation is solid, you can switch all that other stuff. You can paint the wall. You can add another nozzle for your belly. Like, you can do whatever it is that you want to do if the foundation is good. <clears throat> but if the foundation is no good and the foundation has, 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 has holes or corruption, no matter what you do on the outside, you're going to have a bad house. Well, that's what we're going to do in this series. Each week, we're going to look at a foundational principle of the spiritual life, of the healed life. I'm sorry, not the spiritual life. We're going to look at a foundational principle of a life in Christ a salvation, a healed life has to have certain things in the foundation. And each week, we're going to look at one of those foundational things. What we're not going to talk about is fasting and prayer and read your Bible. Not because those aren't important. 
Those things are great, but those things must be built on top of foundation of things like humility and honesty and repentance. And we're going, we've tried all the outside things, okay? But for many of us, if we're honest, our spiritual life feels like, it feels like adding new drapes to a house that has no foundation. Isn't that what it feels like sometimes? It feels like we're trying to paint the walls on the Titanic as it's sinking in the thing. So we need in this series not to focus on the outside, not to focus on the things that can be seen, but to focus on the things that can't be seen and laying a proper foundation. Because that, according to Jesus, that's what is going to make the house stand the test of time. He said this in Matthew 7. He said, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. That's our goal in this series is to make sure the foundation is solid, to fix any holes in the foundation. And I'm telling you, when the foundation is good and the foundation is solid, change the drapes, paint the whatever it is, like do whatever on top of that foundation, that house will stand. And the inverse is also true. So that's the first analogy, the building of the house. The second analogy, we're going to go agriculture. Any farmers here? Anyone like to eat fruit? Okay, very good. That's fantastic. We'll go with that. <clears throat> we're going to talk about soil. We talked about building and foundation. We're going to talk about soil as it gives fruit to the trees or the plants, whatever it may be. Like the builder with the foundation, the smart farmer knows that the most important thing that he will do to give himself fruitfulness is way, way, way before he even picks up a seed, way before he harvests anything. It's in preparing the soil. And if the soil is no good and the soil is hard and the soil is, is, is you know, that, the crunchy kind, okay, that, that, that soil that, that, that's tough, then no matter what kind of seed, you can put the, 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 the miracle grow seed or whatever it is, you put it inside that kind of soil, it's not going to bear much fruit. And again, this is a lot of times our spiritual lives are this way. We're putting great seeds into bad soil that needs work. <clears throat> and for many of us, our soil, just being honest, if we do an honest assessment, our soil is hardened. And it's been hardened by years of focus on the outside and not and neglecting what's on the inside. It's been, it's been hardened by the distractions of this world and the cares of this world and my job and the pressure and the kids and they keep on screaming and when are they going to stop screaming and, and, and the finances and then the, the COVID and then the election and like it's just, it's, or the soil on the inside has been hardened and the soil has been, not I want to say ruined because it's never ruined, but it's gotten tough to the point that, you know what? That the seeds just kind of bounce off it. And we're going to make progress and we're going to find healing. We need to spend more time up front on the soil to break it apart. Okay, and you know that machine, I don't know what it's called, the, this machine, okay, that goes in, okay, and does like this, okay, and it goes deep inside, and it just looks like it hurts the soil so much, and you want to say like, no, go easy on the soil, like that looks like it hurts, but that's what it does, and it's doing that because that's the only way to bring forth fruit. Hosea chapter 10 verse 12 says, break up your fallow ground. Fallow means like hardened soil, okay, like the hard kind. Break it up. Tiller, I think it's called tilling. Isn't it what it called tilling? Okay, what is it tilling? Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. This is a great verse because it shows us how this series is going to work. We're going to work on the soil. And we're going to break up. And we're going to ask ourselves some tough questions in this series. And we're going to look at the man in the mirror, okay, or the woman in the mirror, Okay, and we're going to, to, to look at some stuff. And we're going to say, you know what? There's some things that need to change in there. And we're going to dig and we're going to, to, to make a mess. But you know what? When we do that, he will come and rain righteousness. We're going to work on the soil. We're going to trust him for the fruit. We're going to work on the inside. We're going to trust him on the outside. We're going to work on the foundation. We're going to trust that when we do that, that he will build a beautiful house on the outside. So, <clears throat> builder with the foundation, farmer with the soil, us with the inside, focusing during this time of Lent on building it right on the inside. And the reason why, this will not be easy, as I said, but it will absolutely pay off 
And the reason why, I'll give you this verse from Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. This is a verse for all of us that I believe is true this Lent more than ever. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. This is Jesus saying this. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. This is what Lent is all about. Lent is all about the healer coming and making himself available. And we know that Lent, like we know that the story, the road of Lent ends with him on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. We know exactly where the road ends. The question is, as Christ is walking the road for the salvation slash healing of all mankind, as he is walking that road, which we know he will walk, the question is, will we find him? And will we walk alongside him? And we, what, will we give him a chance to work his healing touch, not just for all mankind, but for me? Is that another way? I know he's coming. Are we ready to receive him? I know he's going to knock at the door. Are we ready to welcome him in? That's the question that we need to wrestle with throughout this time of Lent. So, recap. Our homework assignment is set a goal. And you need to have a specific goal, and it needs to be in writing. Because as long as it's in right there, I'm not saying you got to submit it or anything like that. But get yourself a little journal. Get yourself a Lent journal. Get yourself a journal for this, this series, okay, that you can use and take to your life group and take whatever lessons. And in life group, we're going to talk about a book that we're going to read together. Get yourself a journal and start off day one, what is the goal? What am I driving towards? How do I hope to be any different on day 55 as I was on day one? Lent is not a season. Lent is a journey. What am I trying to accomplish? One time someone asked me this way, said, if God, were to say yes and to grant whatever it is that you say you are driving towards, whatever it is that you're praying for during this time of Lent, what is it that you'd say? That's how I want you to pray. What is it? Okay, because sometimes we think to ourselves, yeah, like, no, be specific. God's going to say yes. To spe- I'm not saying he's going to say yes, but I'm saying, like, that's how we're going to think, that be specific and set ourselves a goal. Where is it that we need God and his healing touch the most? The way it's going to work, we're going to set a goal. We are going to hopefully be attending Life Group throughout this week. Again, I hope everyone here has signed up for Life Group. And if you haven't signed up for Life Group, there's still your last chance is today. Okay, there's still groups that are open. There's still a few groups that are available. And if there's so much demand that we need to open another group, we can absolutely do that. But you got to sign up today. You go to the STSA app. You hit the sign up button. Okay, and there's all kinds of options. That includes youth as well. Okay, there's youth options as well. The whole point is we're going to listen to a message here today. I'm going to give you a homework assignment. You're going to go to life group and you're going to be prepared to put the practical, the teeth on that, the theory that we heard here today. So everyone shows up at life group this week, ready with their goal, prepared to share. Now, if you say mine is too personal, okay, you don't have to share the personal part of it, okay, but you can generalize it, okay? But you need to have the personal, even if you don't share the personal, okay? You need to have it, even necessarily you don't share it. Okay, and if we do that, I promise you, I promise you, I I promise you, I promise you that if you do that, if we do that, I promise you, he will work. I got no doubt that he's going to work. Like I said, after all that we've been through, I know he's going to work. The question is, will I be ready? Will I see him? Will I find him or will I be distracted? Will I be walking around like this when he's over there? Samaritan woman found healing because she found him. Born blind man found him. Paralyzed man found him. Now the question is, will we find him too? And if we do, I promise you, we'll find healing. Can we say our memory verse again? Y'all remember the memory verse? Put it up here on the screen all together. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. The starting point is set a goal at your homework assignment for this week. Second assignment, step two, come back next week and we'll talk about that, okay? But for now, let's stand for a prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the message that you've given us here and for your love for us and your desire to heal all mankind, including me and every single person who's here today. 
I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to seek you with all our hearts and to trust that if we do that, Lord, we know we're going to find you. And we know, Lord, that if you come, you bring salvation, you bring healing with you. And that, Lord, that's what we're driving towards during this time. Bless us all, Lord, during this time and help us to truly seek you with all of our hearts as you told us to do. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, with the prayers of all your saints. Hear us as we pray thankfully, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thanks for joining us here today. We'd love to connect with you throughout the week. You can find us on any social media platform where you may feel free to share a message that inspires you with family and friends. If you'd like to receive our weekly email, please click the Stay Connected button on our website, stsa.church. If there's anything we can do for you, please visit our website and let us know how we can help you or how we can pray for you. Thanks again for joining us and have a great day.